Chapter Number Twenty Five of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shows Gabrielle in exile, midway between historic Fotheringay and ancient Apethorpe, the ancestral seat of the Earls of Westmoreland, lay the long, straggling, and rather poverty-stricken village of Wood Newton. Like many other Northamptonshire villages, it consisted of one long street of cottages many of them with dormer windows peeping from beneath the brown thatch the better houses of stone with old mullioned windows but all of them more or less in stages of decay with the depreciation in agriculture wood newton once quite a prosperous little place was now terribly shabby and depressing as he entered the village the first object that met the eye of the stranger was a barn with a roof half fallen away and next in a ruined house with its moss-grown thatch full of holes the paving was ill-kept and even the several inns bore an appearance of struggles with poverty halfway up the long straight dispiriting street stood a cottage larger and neater looking than the rest its ugly exterior was half hidden by ivy which had been cut away from the diamond-paned windows while unlike its neighbours its roof was tiled and its brown door newly painted and highly varnished old miss hayburn lived there and had lived there for the past half-century the prim gray-haired and somewhat eccentric old lady was a well-known figure to all on that countryside twice each sunday with her large type prayer-book in her hand and her still-rimmed spectacles on her thin nose she walked to church while she was one of the principal supporters of the village clothing club and such like institutions inaugurated by the worthy rector essentially an ascetic person she was looked upon with fear by all the villagers her manner was brusque her speech sharp and her criticism of neglectful mothers caustic and much to the point prim always in black bonnet and jet trimmed cape of years gone by both in summer and winter she took no heed of the vagaries of fashion even when they reached wood newton so tardily the common report was that when a girl she had been crossed in love for her single maid-servant she always trained to a sober and loveless like like her own and as soon as a girl cast an eye upon a, a likely swain she was ignominiously dismissed that the sharp-tongued spinster possessed means was undoubted it was known that she was sister of sir henry hayburn of castor in lincolnshire and on account of her social standing she on rare occasions was bidden to the omnium gatherings at some of the mansions in the neighbourhood she seldom accepted but when she did it was only to satisfy her curiosity and to criticise the household of two the old lady and her exemplary maid was assuredly a dull one meals were taken with punctual regularity amid a cleanliness that was almost painful the tiny drawing-room with its row of window plants including a pot of strong-smelling musk was hardly ever entered not a speck of dust was allowed anywhere for miss emily's eye was sharp and woe betide the maid if a mere suspicion of dirt were discovered everything was kept locked up one maid who resigned hurriedly refusing to be criticized afterwards declared that her mistress kept the paraffin under lock and key and into this uncomfortably prim and proper household little gabrielle had suddenly been introduced her heart overburdened by grief and full of regret at being compelled to part from the father she so fondly loved she had accepted the inevitable fully realizing the dull grayness of the life that lay before her surely her exile there was a cruel and crushing one the house seemed so tiny and so suffocating after the splendid halls and huge rooms at glencardine while her aunt's constant sarcasm about her father whom she had not seen for eight years was particularly galling the woman treated the girl as a wayward child sent there for punishment and correction she showed her neither kindness nor consideration for truth to tell it annoyed her to think that her brother should have imposed a girl upon her she hated to be bothered with the girl but existing upon sir henry's charity as she really did though none knew it she could do no otherwise than accept his daughter as her guest days weeks months had passed each day dragging on as its predecessor a wretched hopeless despairing existence to a girl so full of life and vitality as gabrielle though she had written several times to her father he had sent her no reply 
to her mother at san remo she had also written and from her had received one letter cold and unresponsive from walter murie nothing not a single word the well-thumbed books in the village library she had read as well as those in the possession of her aunt she had tried needlework problems of patience and the translation of a few chapters of an italian novel into english in order to occupy her time but those hours when she was alone in her little upstairs room with the sloping roof passed alas so very slowly upon her ever oppressive were thoughts of that bitter past at one staggering blow she had lost all that had made her young life worth living her father's esteem and her lover's love she was innocent entirely innocent of the terrible allegations against her and yet she was so utterly defenceless often she sat at her little window for hours watching the lethargy of village life in the street below that rural life in which the rector and the schoolmaster were the principal figures the dullness of it all was maddening her aunt's mid-victorian primness her snappishness towards the trembling maid and the thousand and one rules of her daily life irritated her and jarred upon her nerves so in order to kill time and at the same time to study the antiquities of the neighborhood her father having taught her so much deep antiquarian knowledge it had been her habit for three months past to take long walks for many miles across the country accompanied by the black collie rover belonging to a young farmer who lived at the end of the village the animal had one day attached itself to her while she was taking a walk on the agthorpe road and now by her feeding him daily and making a pet of him the girl and the dog had become inseparable by long walks and short train journeys she had in three months been able to inspect most of the antiquities of northamptonshire much of the history of the county was intensely interesting the connection of old fortheringay with the ill-fated mary queen of scots the beauties of peterborough cathedral the splendid old tudor house of dean the home of the earls of cardigan the legends of king john concerning king's cliff the gaunt splendor of ruined kirby and the old world charm of abthorpe all these and many others had great attraction for her she read them up in books she ordered from london and then visited the old places with all the enthusiasm of a speckled antiquary every day no matter what the weather she might be seen in her thick boots burberry and tam o shanter trudging along the roads or across the fields accompanied by the faithful collie the winter had been a comparatively mild one with excessive rain but no downpour troubled her she liked the rain to beat into her face for the dismal monotonous cheerlessness of the brown fields bare trees and muddy roads was in keeping with the tragedy of her own young life she knew that her aunt emily disliked her the covert sneers the caustic criticisms and the go-to meeting attitude of the old lady irritated the girl beyond measure she was not wanted in that painfully prim cottage and had been made to understand it from the first day hence it was that she spent all the time she possibly could out of doors alone she had traversed the whole county seeking permission to glance at the interior of any old house or building that promised archaeological interest and by that means making some curious friendships many people regarded the pretty young girl who made a study of old churches and old houses as somewhat eccentric local antiquaries however stared at her in wonder when they found that she was possessed of knowledge far more profound than theirs and that she could decipher old documents and read latin inscriptions with ease she made few friends preferring solitude and reflection to visiting and gossiping hers was indeed a pathetic little figure and the country folk used to stare at her in surprise and sigh as she passed through the various little hamlets and villages so regularly the black collie bounding before her quickly she had become known as miss hayburn's niece and the report having spread that she was a bit eccentric poor thing people soon ceased to wonder and began to regard that pale sad face with sympathy the whole countryside was wondering why such a pretty young lady had gone to live in the deadly dullness of wood newton and what was the cause of that great sorrow written upon her countenance her daily burden of bitter reflection was indeed hard to bear her one thought as she walked those miles of lonely rural byways so bare and cheerless was of walter her walter the man who she knew would have willingly given his very life for hers 
she had met her punishment and was now endeavouring to bear it bravely she had renounced his love for ever one afternoon dark and rainy in the gloom of early march she was sitting at the old-fashioned and rather tuneless piano in the damp unused best room which was devoid of fire for economic reasons her aunt was seated in the window busily crocheting while she with her white fingers running across the keys raised her sweet contralto voice in that old-world florentine song that for centuries had been sung by the populace in the streets of the city by the amo in questa note in sogno lo vetuto era vestito tutto di brocato le pum sol berretto di svelotto e d'una spada d'oro aveva alato e poi ma dero con un bel sorriso io non posso star de da divisa da da divisa non si posso stare eterno per me più non lasciare miss hayburn sighed and looked up from her work can't you sing something in english gabrielle it would be much better she remarked in a snappy tone the girl's mouth hardened slightly at the corners and she closed the piano without replying i don't mean you to stop exclaimed the ascetic old lady i only think that girls instead of learning foreign songs should be able to sing english ones properly won't you sing another no replied the girl rising the rain has ceased so i shall go for my walk and she left the room to put on her hat and mackintosh passing along before the window a few minutes later in the direction of king's cliff it was always the same if she indulged herself in singing one or other of those ancient love songs of the hot-blooded tuscan peasants her aunt always scolded nothing she did was right for the simple reason that she was an unwelcome visitor she was alone rover was conducting sheep to stamford market as was his duty every week therefore in the fading daylight she went along immersed in her own sad thoughts her walk at that hour was entirely aimless she had only gone forth because of the irritation she felt at her aunt's constant complaints so entirely engrossed was she by her own despair that she had not noticed the figure of a man who catching sight of her at the end of wood newton village had held back until she had gone a considerable distance and had then sauntered leisurely in the direction she had taken the man kept her in view but did not approach her the high red mail cart passed and the driver touched his hat respectfully to her the man who collected the evening mail from all the villages between dean and peterborough met her almost every evening and had long ago inquired and learnt who she was for nearly two miles she walked onward until close by the junction of the road which comes down the hill from nassington the man who had been following hastened up and overtook her she heard herself addressed by name and turning quickly found herself face to face with james flockhart End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain the velvet paw the newcomer stood before gabrielle hat in hand smiling pleasantly and uttering a greeting of surprise her response was cold for was not all her present unhappiness due to him i've come here to speak to you gabrielle to speak to you in confidence whatever you have to say may surely be said in the hearing of a third person was her dignified answer his sudden appearance had startled her but only for a moment she was cool again next instant and on her guard against her enemy i hardly think he said with a meaning smile that you would really like me to speak before a third party i really care nothing was her answer and i cannot see why you seek me here when one is hopeless as i am one becomes callous of what the future may bring hopeless yes he said in a changed voice i know that living in this dismal hole gabrielle you must be hopeless i know that your exile here away from all your friends and those you love must be soul-killing don't think that i have not reflected upon it a hundred times ah then you have at last experienced remorse she cried bitterly looking straight into the man's face you have estranged me from my father and tried to ruin him you lied to him lied in order to save yourself the man laughed my dear child he exclaimed 
you really misjudge me entirely i am here for two reasons to ask your forgiveness for making that allegation which was imperative and secondly to assure you that if you will allow me i will yet be your friend friend she echoed in a hollow voice you my friend yes i know that you mistrust me he replied but i want to prove that my intentions toward you are those of real friendship and you who ever since my girlhood days have been my worst enemy ask me now to trust you she exclaimed with indignation no go back to lady hayburn and tell her that i refuse to accept the olive branch which you and she hold out to me my dear girl you don't follow me he exclaimed impatiently this has nothing whatever to do with lady hayburn i have come to you from purely personal motives my sole desire is to effect your return to glencardine for your own ends mr flockhart without a doubt she said bitterly ah there you are quite mistaken though you assert that i am your father's enemy i am i tell you his friend he is ever thinking of you with regret you were his right hand would it not be far better if he invited you to return she sighed at the thought of the blind man whom she regarded with such entire devotion but answered no i shall never return to glencardine why he asked was anything more than natural that believing you had been prying into his affairs your father in a moment of anger condemned you to this life of appalling monotony no not more natural than that you the culprit should have made me the scapegoat for the second time was her defiant reply have i not already told you that the reason i am here is to crave your forgiveness i admit that my actions have been the reverse of honourable but well there were circumstances which compelled me to act as i did you got an impression of my father's safe key had a duplicate made in glasgow as i have found out and one night opened the safe and copied certain private documents having regard to a proposed loan to the greek government the night i discovered you was the second occasion when you went to the library and opened the safe do you deny that what you allege gabrielle is perfectly correct he replied i know that i was a blackguard to shield myself behind you to tell you the lie i did that night but how could i avoid it suppose i had in retaliation spoken the truth she asked looking the man straight in the face ah i knew that you would not do that you believe that i dare not dare not for my own sake eh he nodded in the affirmative then you are much mistaken mr flockhart she said in a hard voice you don't understand that a woman may become desperate i can understand how desperate you have become living in this sleepy hollow a week of it would i admit drive me to distraction then if you understand my present position you will know that i am fearless of you or of anybody else my life has ended i have neither happiness comfort peace of mind nor love all is of the past to you you james flockhart i am indebted for all this you have held me powerless i was a happy girl once but you and your dastardly friends crossed my path like an evil shadow and i have existed in an inferno of remorse ever since i remorse how absurdly you talk it will not be absurd when i speak the truth and tell the world what i know it will be rather a serious matter for you mr flockhart you threaten me he asked his eyes flashing for a second i think it is as well for us to understand one another at once she said frankly they had halted upon a small bridge close to the entrance to apethorpe village then i am to understand that you refuse my proffered assistance he asked i require no assistance from my enemies was her defiant and dignified reply i suppose lady hayburn is at the villa at san remo as usual and that it was she who sent you to me because she recognizes that you've both gone a little too far you have when the opportunity arises then i shall speak regardless of the consequences therefore mr flockhart i wish you good evening and she turned away no gabrielle he cried resolutely barring her path you must hear me you don't grasp the point of my argument with me none of your arguments are of any avail was her response in a bitter tone i alas have reason to know you too well for you by your clever intrigue i committed a crime but god knows i am innocent of what was intended 
now that you have estranged me from my father and my lover i shall confess confess all before i make an end of my life he saw from her pale drawn face that she was desperate he grew afraid but my dear girl think of what you are saying you don't mean it you can't mean it your father has relented and will welcome you back if only you will consent to return i have no wish to be regarded as the prodigal daughter was her proud response not for walter murray's sake asked the crafty man i have seen him i was at the club with him last night and we had a chat about you he loves you very dearly ah you do not know how he is suffering she was silent and he recognized in an instant that his words had touched the sympathetic chord in her heart he is not suffering any greater grief than i am she said in a low mechanical voice her brow heavily clouded of course i quite understand that he remarked sympathetically walter is a good fellow and well it is indeed sad that matters should be as they are he is entirely devoted to you gabrielle not more so than i am to him declared the girl quite frankly then why did you write breaking off your engagement he told you that she exclaimed in surprise the truth was that murray had told flockhart nothing he had not even seen him it was only a wild guess on flockhart's part tell me she urged anxiously what did he say concerning myself flockhart hesitated his mind was instantly active in the concoction of a story oh well he expressed the most profound regret for all that had occurred at glencardine and is of course utterly puzzled it appears that just before christmas he went home to conacan and visited your father several times from him i suppose he heard how you had been discovered you told him nothing i told him nothing declared flockhart which was a fact did he express a wish to see me she inquired of course he did is he not head over ears in love with you he believes you have treated him cruelly i i know i have mr flockhart she admitted but i acted as any girl of honour would have done i was compelled to take upon myself a great disgrace and on doing so i released him from his promise to me most honourable the man declared with a pretence of admiration yet underlying it all was a craftiness that surely was unsurpassed that visit of his to northamptonshire was made with some ulterior motive yet what it was the girl was unable to discover she would surely have been cleverer than most people had she been able to discern the hidden sinister motives of james flockhart the truth was that he had not seen murray and the story of his anxiety he had only concocted on the spur of the moment walter asked me to give you a message he went on he asked me to urge you to return to glencardine and to withdraw that letter you wrote him before your departure to return to glencardine she repeated staring in his face walter wishes me to do that why because he loves you because he will intercede with your father on your behalf my father will hear nothing in my favor until and she paused until what until i tell him the whole truth that you will never do remarked flockhart quickly ah there you are mistaken she responded in all probability i shall then before you do so pray weigh carefully the dire results he urged in a changed tone oh i've already done that long ago she said i know that i am in your hands utterly and irretrievably mr flockhart and the only way i can regain my freedom is by boldly telling the truth you must never do that by heaven you shall not he cried looking fiercely into her clear eyes i know i'm quite well aware of your attitude towards me the claws cannot be entirely concealed in the cat's paw you know and she laughed bitterly into his face the corners of the man's mouth hardened he was about to speak and show himself in his true colours but by dint of great self-control he managed to smile and exclaim then you will take no heed of these wishes of the man who loves you so dearly of the man who is still your best and most devoted friend you prefer to remain here and wear out your young life with vain regrets and shattered affections come gabrielle do be sensible the girl did not speak for several moments does walter really wish me to return she asked looking straight at him as though trying to discern whether he was really speaking the truth yes he expressed to me a strong wish that you should either return to glencardine or go and live at park street he wishes to see me of course 
it would perhaps be better if you met him first either down here or in london why should you two not be happy he went on i know it is my fault you are consigned to this dismal life and that you and walter are parted but believe me gabrielle i am at this moment endeavouring to bring you together again and to reinstate you in sir henry's good graces he is longing for you to return when i saw him last at glencardine he told me that monsieur goslin was not so clever at typing or in grasping his meaning as you are and he is only awaiting your return that may be so answered the girl in a slow distinct voice but perhaps you'll tell me mr flockhart the reason you evinced such an unwanted curiosity in my father's affairs my dear girl laughed the man surely that isn't a fair question i had certain reasons of my own yes assisted by lady heyburn you thought that you could make money by obtaining knowledge of my father's secrets oh yes i know i know more than you have ever imagined declared the girl boldly you hope to get rid of monsieur goslin from glencardine and reinstate me for your own ends i see it all the man bit his lip with chagrin he recognized that he had blundered and that she shrewd and clever had taken advantage of his error he was however too clever to exhibit his annoyance you are quite wrong in your surmise gabrielle he said quickly walter murie loves you and loved you well therefore with regret at my compulsory denunciation of yourself i am now endeavouring to assist you thank you she responded coldly again turning away abruptly i require no assistance from a man such as yourself a man who entrapped me and who denounced me in order to save himself you will regret these words he declared as she walked away in the direction of wood newton she turned upon him in fierce anger retorting and perhaps you on your part will regret your endeavour to entrap me a second time i have promised to speak the truth and i shall keep my promise i am not afraid to sacrifice my own life to save my father's honour the man stood staring after her these words of hers held him motionless what if she flung her good name to the winds and actually carried out her threat what if she really spoke the truth ay what then end of chapter twenty six chapter number twenty seven of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain betrays the bond the girl hurried on her heart filled with wonder her eyes brimming with tears of indignation the one thought occupying her whole mind was whether walter really wished to see her again had flockhart spoken the truth the serious face of the man she loved so well rose before her blurred vision she had been his his very own until she had sent off that fateful letter in five minutes flockhart had again overtaken her his attitude was appealing he urged her to at least see her lover again even if she refused to write or return to her father why do you come here to taunt me like this she cried turning upon him angrily once because you were my mother's friend i believed in you but you deceived me and in consequence you hold me in your power were it not for that i could have spoken to my father have told him the truth and cleared myself he now believes that i have betrayed his business secrets while at the same time he considers you to be his friend i am his friend gabrielle the man declared why tell me such a lie she asked reproachfully do you think i too am blind certainly not i give you credit for being quite as clever and as intelligent as you are dainty and charming i thank you she cried in indignation i require no compliments from you lady heyburn has expressed a wish to see you he said she is still in san remo and asked me to invite you to go down there for a few weeks your aunt has written her i think complaining that you are not very comfortable at wood newton i have not complained why should aunt emily complain of me you seem to be the bearer of messages from the whole of my family mr flockhart i am here entirely in your own interest my dear child he declared with that patronizing air which so irritated her not entirely i think she said smiling bitterly i tell you i much regret all that has happened and you regret she cried fiercely do you regret the end of that woman you know whom i mean beneath her straight glance he quivered she had referred to a subject which he feigned would have buried forever. 
this dainty neat-waisted girl knew a terrible secret was it not only too true as lady heyburn had vaguely suggested a dozen times that her mouth ought to be effectually sealed he had sealed it once as he thought her fear to explain to her father the incident of the opening of the safe had given him confidence that no word of the truth regarding the past would ever pass her lips yet he saw that his own machinations were now likely to prove his undoing the web which with her ladyship's assistance he had woven about her was now stretched to breaking point if it did yield then the result must be ruin and worse therefore he was straining every effort to again reinstate her in her father's good graces and restore in her mind something akin to confidence but all his arguments as he walked on at her side in the gathering gloom proved useless she was in no mood to listen to the man who had been her evil genius ever since her school days as he was speaking she was wondering if she dared go to walter murray and tell him everything what would her lover think of her what indeed he would only cast her aside as worthless no far better that he should remain in ignorance and retain only sad memories of their brief happiness i am going to glencardine to-night flockhart went on i shall join the mail at peterborough what shall i tell your father tell him the truth was her reply that i know you will not do so why need we waste further words do you actually refuse then to leave this dismal hole he demanded impatiently yes until i speak and tell my father the plain and ghastly story rubbish he ejaculated you'll never do that unless you wish to stand beside me in a criminal dock well rather that than be your cat's paw longer mr flockhart she cried her face flushing with indignation oh oh he laughed still quite imperturbed come come this is scarcely a wise reply my dear little girl i wish you to leave me you have insulted my intelligence enough this evening surely you who only a moment ago declared yourself my friend slowly he selected a cigarette from his gold case and halting lit it well if you meet my well-meant efforts on your behalf with open antagonism like this i can't make any further suggestion no please don't go up to glencardine and do your worst for me i am now fully able to take care of myself she exclaimed in defiance you can also write to lady heyburn and tell her that i am still and that i will always remain my blind father's friend but why don't you listen to reason gabrielle he implored her i don't now seek to lessen or deny the wrongs i have done you in the past nor do i attempt to conceal from you my own position my only object is to bring you and walter together again her ladyship knows the whole circumstances and deeply regrets them her regret will be the more poignant some day i assure you then you really intend to act vindictively i shall act just as i think proper she exclaimed halting a moment and facing him please understand that though i have been forced in the past to act as you have indicated because i feared you because i had my reputation and my father's honour at stake i hold you in terror no longer mr flockhart well i'm glad you've told me that he said laughing as though he treated her declaration with humour it's just as well perhaps that we should now thoroughly understand each other yet if i were you i wouldn't do anything rash by telling the truth you'd be the only sufferer you know the only sufferer why well you don't imagine i should be such a fool as to admit that what you said was true do you she looked at him in surprise it had never occurred to her that he with his innate unscrupulousness and cunning might deny her allegations and might even be able to prove them false the truth could not be denied she said simply recollect the cutting from the edinburgh paper truth is denied every day in courts of law he retorted no before you act foolishly remember that put to the test your word would stand alone against mine and those of other people why the very story you would tell would be so utterly amazing and startling that the world would declare you had invented it reflect upon it for a moment and you'll find my dear girl that silence is golden in this as in any other circumstance in life she raised her eyes to his and met his gaze firmly so you defy me to speak she cried 
you think that i will remain in this accursed bondage of yours i utter no threats my dear child replied flockhart i have never in my life threatened you i merely ventured to point out certain difficulties which you might have in substantiating any allegation which you might make against me for that reason if for none other is it not better for us to be friends i am not the friend of my father's enemy she declared you are quite heroic he declared with a covert sneer if you really are bent upon providing the halfpenny newspapers with a fresh sensation pray let me know in plenty of time won't you i have had sufficient of your taunts cried the girl bursting into a flood of hot tears leave me i-i'll say no further word to you except to forgive me he added why should i she asked through her tears because for your own sake for the sake of your future it will surely be best he pointed out you no doubt in ignorance of legal procedure believed that what you alleged would be accepted in a court of justice but reflect fully before you again threaten me dry your eyes or your aunt may suspect something wrong she did not reply what he said impressed her and he did not fail to recognize that fact he smiled within himself when he saw that he had triumphed yet he had not gained his point she dashed away her tears with the little wisp of lace annoyed with herself at betraying her indignation in that womanly way she knew him alas too well she mistrusted him for she was well aware of how cleverly he had once conspired with lady heyburn and with what ingenuity she herself had been drawn into the disgraceful and amazing affair true it was that her story if told in a criminal court would prove so extraordinary that it would not be believed true also that he would of course deny it and that his denial would be borne out by the woman who though her father's wife was his worst enemy the man placed his hand on her shoulder saying may we not be friends gabrielle she shook him off roughly responding in the negative but we are not enemies i mean we will not be enemies as we have been shall we he urged to this she made no reply she only quickened her pace for the twilight was fast deepening and she wished to be back again at her aunt's house why had that man followed her why indeed had he troubled to come there she could not discern his motive they walked together in silence he was watching her face reading it like a book then when they neared the first thatched cottage at the entrance to the village he halted asking may we not now become friends gabrielle will you not listen and take my advice or will you still remain buried here i have nothing further to say mr flockhart than what i have already said was her defiant response i shall act as i think best and you will dare to speak and place yourself in a ridiculous position you mean i shall use my own judgment in defending my father from his enemies was her cold response as with a slight shrug of her shoulders she turned and left him hurrying forward in the darkening twilight along the village street to her aunt's home he on his part turned upon his hill with a muttered remark and set out again to walk towards the nassington station whence after nearly an hour's wait in the village inn he took train to peterborough the girl had once again defied him End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain the whispers again was it really true what flockhart had told her did walter actually wish to see her again at one moment she believed in her lover's strong passionate devotion to her for had she not seen it displayed in a hundred different ways but the next she recollected how that man flockhart had taken advantage of her youth and inexperience in the past how he had often lied so circumstantially that she had believed his words to be the truth once indeed he had openly declared to her that one of his maxims was never to tell the truth unless obliged after dinner a simple meal served in the poky little dining-room she made an excuse to go to her room and there sat for a long time deeply reflecting should she write to walter would it be judicious to explain flockhart's visit and how he had urged their reconciliation if she wrote would it lower her dignity in her lover's eyes that was the great problem which now troubled her she sat staring before her undecided 
she recalled all that flockhart had told her he was the emissary of lady heyburn without a doubt the girl had told him openly of her decision to speak the truth and expose him but he had only laughed at her alas she knew his true character unscrupulous and pitiless but she placed him aside recollection of walter the man who had held her so often in his arms and pressed his hot lips to hers the man who was her father's firm friend and whose uprightness and honesty of purpose she had ever admired crowded upon her should she write to him rigid and staring she sat in her chair her little white hands clenched as she tried to summon courage it had been she who had written declaring that their secret engagement must be broken she who had condemned herself therefore had she not a right to satisfy that longing she had had through months the longing to write to him once again the thought decided her and going to the table whereon the lamp was burning she sat down and after some reflection penned a letter as follows my sweetheart my darling my own my soul mine only mine i'm wondering how and where you are true i wrote you a cruel letter but it was imperative and under the force of circumstance i am full of regrets and i only wish with all my heart that i might kiss you once again and press you in my arms as i used to do but how are you i have had you before my eyes to-night and i feel quite sure that at this very moment you are thinking of me you must know that i love you dearly you gave me your heart and it shall not belong to any other i have tried to be brave and courageous but alas i have failed i love you my darling and i must see you soon very soon mr flockart came to see me to-day and says that you express to him a desire to meet me again gratify that desire when you will and you will find your gabrielle just the same longing ever to see you living with only the memories of your dear face can you doubt of my great great love for you you never wrote in reply to my letter though have waited for months i know my letter was a cruel one and to you quite unwarranted but i had a reason for writing it and the reason was because i felt that i ought not to deceive you any longer you see darling i am frank and open yes i have deceived you i am terribly ashamed and downhearted i have tried to conceal my grief even from you but it is impossible i love you as much as i ever loved you and i swear to you that i have never once wavered grim circumstance forced me to write to you as i did forgive me i beg of you if it is true what mr flockhart says then send me a telegram and come here to see me if it be false then i shall know by your silence i love you my own my well-beloved au revoir my dearest heart i look at your photograph which to-night smiles at me yes you love me with many fond and sweet kisses like those i gave you in the well-remembered days of our happiness my love my king she read the letter carefully through placed it in an envelope marking it private addressed it to walters's chambers in the temple whence she knew it must be forwarded if he were away then putting on her tam o shanter she went out to the village grocer's where she posted it so that it left by the early morning mail when would his welcome telegram arrive she calculated that he would get the letter by midday and by one o'clock she could receive his reply his reassurance of love so she went to her bed with its white dimity hangings more calm and composed than for months before for a long time she lay awake thinking of him listening hour by hour to the chiming bells of the old norman church they marked the passing of the night then she dropped off to sleep to be awakened by the sun streaming into the room that same morning away up in the highlands of glencardine sir henry had groped his way across the library to his accustomed chair and hill had placed before him one of the shallow drawers of the cabinet of seal impressions there were fully half a dozen which had been sent to him by the curator of the museum at norwich sulphur casts of seals recently acquired by that institution the blind man had put aside that morning to examine them and settled himself to his task with the keen and pleasurable anticipation of the expert they were very fine specimens the blind man sitting alone selected one and fingering it very carefully for a long time at last made out its design in the inscription upon it the seal of abbot 
simon de luton of the early thirteenth century he said slowly to himself the wolf guards the head of st edmund as it does in the seal of the benedictine abbey of bury st edmunds while the virgin with the child is over the canopy and the verse is indeed curious for its quaintness virgo dum furt du caput a furt quad lupus hic furt then he again retraced the letters with his sensitive fingers to reassure himself that he had made no mistake the next he drew towards him proved to be the seal of the vice warden of the grey friars of cambridge a pointed one used about the year twelve forty four which to himself he declared in heraldic language to bear the device of a cross raggly debruised by a spear and a crown of thorns in bend dexter and a sponge on a staff in bend sinister between two threefold flagella in base surely a formidable array of the instruments used in the passion deeply interested and speaking to himself aloud as was his habit when alone he examined them one after the other among the collection were the seals of berenger de broly plebanus of passina in syracuse and those of the common of bouvet twelve twenty eight mathilde or mahout daughter of henry duke of brabant twelve sixty five the town of Ludenburg in west flanders and of the vicar provincial of the carmelite order at palermo thirteen fifty jacobus de napt bishop of rennes fourteen eighty and of bondi marquis of sausalinia bologna thirteen twenty three he had almost concluded when goslin the grey-bearded frenchman having breakfasted alone in the dining-room entered ah mon cher sir henry he exclaimed at work so early the study of seals must be very fascinating to you though i confess that for myself i could never see in them very much to interest one no to the ordinary person my dear goslin it appears no doubt a most dry as dust study but a man afflicted like myself it is the only study that he can pursue for with his fingertips he can learn the devices and decipher the inscriptions the blind baronet declared take for instance only this little collection of a dozen or so impressions which they have so kindly sent to me from norwich each one of them tells me something its device its general character its heraldry its inscription are all highly instructive for the collector there are opportunities for the study of the historical allusions the emblematology and imagery the hagiology and biographical and topographical episodes and the other peculiarities and idiosyncrasies in all the seals he possesses goslin like most other people had been many times bored by the old man's technical discourses upon his hobby but he never showed it he just the same as the other people made pretence of being interested yes he remarked they must be most instructive to the student i recollect seeing a great quantity in the bargello at florence ah a very fine collection part of the medici collection and contains some of the finest italian and spanish specimens remarked the blind connoisseur birch of the british museum is quite right in declaring that the seal portable and abounding in detail not difficult of acquisition nor hard to read if we set about deciphering the story it has to tell takes us back as we look upon it to the very time of its making and sets us as it were face to face with the actual owners of the relic the frenchman sighed he saw he was in for a long dissertation and moving uneasily towards the window changed the topic of conversation by saying i had a long letter from paris this morning crayle is back again it appears ah that man cried the other impatiently when will his extraordinary energies be suppressed they are watching him carefully i suppose of course replied the frenchman he left paris about a month ago but unfortunately the men watching him did not follow he took train for berlin and has been absent until now we ought to know where he's been goslin declared the older man what fool was it who keeping him under surveillance allowed him to slip from paris the russian chernin i thought him a clever fellow but it seems that he's a bungler after all but while we keep Crail at arm's length, as we are doing, what have we to fear? asked Goslin. Yes, but how long can we keep him at arm's length? queried Sir Henry. You know the kind of man, one of the most extraordinarily inventive in Europe. No secret is safe from him. Do you know, Goslin? he added in a changed voice, 
I live nowadays somehow in constant apprehension. You've never possessed the same self-confidence since you found Mademoiselle Gabrielle with the safe open, he remarked. No, Murray, or some other man she knows, must have induced her to do that, and take copies of those documents. Fortunately, I suspected an attempt, and baited the trap accordingly. What caused you to suspect? Because more than once both Murray and the girl seemed to be seized by an unusual desire to pry into my business. You don't think that our friend Flockhart had anything to do with the affair? The Frenchman suggested. No, no, not in the least. I know Flockhart too well, declared the old man. Once I looked upon him as my enemy, but I have now come to the conclusion that he is a friend, a very good friend. The Frenchman pulled a rather wry face and remained silent. I know, Sir Henry went on. I know quite well that his constant association with my wife has caused a good deal of gossip but I have dismissed it all with the contempt that such attempted scandal deserves. It had been put about by a pack of women who are jealous of my wife's good looks and her chic in dress. Are not Flockhart and Mademoiselle also good friends? inquired Goslin. No, I happen to know that they are not, and that very fact in itself shows me that Gabrielle, in trying to get at the secret of my business, was not aided by Flockhart, for it is he who exposed her. Yes, remarked the Frenchman, so you've told me before. Have you heard from Mademoiselle lately? Only twice since she has left here, was the old man's bitter reply. And that was twice too frequently. I've done with her, Goslin. Done with her entirely. Never in all my life did I receive such a crushing blow as when I found out that she, in whom I reposed the utmost confidence, had played her own father false, and might have ruined him. Yes remarked the other sympathetically. It was a great blow to you, I know. But will you not forgive Mademoiselle? Forgive her? he cried fiercely. Forgive her? Never! The gray-bearded Frenchman, who had always been a great favorite with Gabrielle, sighed slightly, and gave his shoulders a shrug of regret. Why do you ask that? inquired Sir Henry, when she herself admitted that she had been at the safe. Because, and the other hesitated, well, for several reasons. The story of your quarrel with Mademoiselle has leaked out. The whispers, eh, Goslin? laughed the old man in defiance. Let the people believe what they will. My daughter shall never return to Glencardine. Never. As he had been speaking, the door had opened, and James Flockhart stood upon the threshold. He had overheard the blind man's words, and as he came forward he smiled, more in satisfaction than in greeting. End of chapter 28Yes, strange, isn't it? How two men may drift apart for years, and then suddenly meet in a club, as we have done, Murray. Being with those fellows who were anxious to go along and see this show at the Empire last night, I had no opportunity of having a chat with you, my dear old chap. That's why I asked you to look in. The two men were seated in Walter's dingy chambers on the second floor in Fig Tree Court Temple. The room was an old and rather frowsy one, with shabby leather furniture from which the stuffing protruded, paneled walls, a carpet almost threadbare, and a formidable array of calf-bound volumes in the cases lining one wall. The place was heavy with tobacco smoke, as the pair, reclining in easy chairs, were in the full enjoyment of very excellent cigars. Walter's visitor was a tall, dark man, some six or seven years his senior, a rather spare, lantern-jawed young fellow, whose dark gray clothes were of unmistakable foreign cut, and whose mustache was carefully trained to an upward trend. No second glance was required to decide that Edgar Hamilton was a person who, having lived a long time on the continent, had acquired the cosmopolitan manner both in gesture and in dress. "'Well!' exclaimed Murray at last, blowing a cloud of smoke from his lips. 
since we parted at oxford i have been called to the bar as you see as for practice well i haven't any the governor wants me to go in for politics so i'm trying to please him by getting my hand in i make an odd speech or two sometimes in out-of-the-world villages and i hope one day to find myself the adopted candidate for some borough or other last year i was sent round the world by my fond parents in order to obtain a broader view of life is it not tacitus who says sua cuc vita obscura e eh? yes my dear fellow replied hamilton stretching himself lazily in his chair and surely we can say with marshall non e vivre se valer vita i am well therefore i am alive mine has been a rather curious career up to the present i only once heard of you after oxford through arthur price who was you'll remember at balliol he wrote he'd spoken one night to you when at supper at the savoy you had a bevy of beauties with you he said both men laughed in the old days edgar hamilton had been essentially a ladies man but since they had parted one evening on the station platform at oxford hamilton had gone up to town and completely out of the life of walter murray they had not met until the previous evening when walter having dined at the devonshire that comfortable old world club in st james's street which was the famous crockford's gaming-house in the days of the dandies he had met his old friend in the stranger's smoking-room the guest of a city stockbroker who was entertaining a party a hurried greeting of surprise and an invitation to call in at the temple resulted in that meeting on that gray afternoon six years had gone since they had parted and judging from edgar's exterior he had been pretty prosperous walter was laughing and commenting upon it when his friend removing his cigar from his lips said my dear fellow my success has been entirely due to one incident which is quite romantic in fact if anybody wrote it in a book people would declare it to be fiction that's interesting tell me all about it my own life has been humdrum enough in all conscience as a budding politician i have to browse upon blue books and chew statistics and mine has been one of travel adventure and considerable excitement declared hamilton six months after i left oxford i found myself out in transcascasia as a newspaper correspondent as you know i often wrote articles for some of the more precious papers when at college while well, one of them sent me out to travel through the disturbed kurdish districts I had a tough time from the start. I was out with a Cossack party in Tai Aras Valley, east of Erevan, for six months, and wrote lots of articles which created a good deal of sensation here in England. You may have seen them, but they were anonymous. The life of excitement, sometimes fighting, and at others in ambush in the mountains, suited me admirably, for I am a born adventurer, I believe. One day, however, a strange thing happened. I was riding along alone through one of the mountain passes toward the Caspian when I discovered three wild, fierce looking Kurds maltreating a girl, believing her to be a Russian. I called upon them to release her, for she was little more than a child, and as they did not, I shot two of the men. The third shot and plugged me rather badly in the leg, but I had the satisfaction that my shots attracted my Cossack companions, who, coming quickly on the spot, killed all three of the girl's assailants and released her by jove laughed murray was she pretty not extraordinarily a fair-haired girl of about fifteen dressed in european clothes i fainted from loss of blood and don't remember anything else until i found myself in a tent with two cossacks patching up my wound when i came to she rushed forward and thanked me profusely for saving her to my surprise she spoke in french and on inquiry i found that she was the daughter of a certain baron conrad de hetzendorf in austrian who possessed a house in budapest and a chateau at semlin in south hungary she told us a curious story her father had some business in transcaucasia and she had induced him to take her with him on his journey only certain districts of the country were disturbed and apparently with their guide and escort they had unwittingly entered the heiress region one of the most lawless of them all in ignorance of what was in progress she and her father accompanied by a guide and four cossacks had been riding along when they met a party of kurds who had attacked them both father and daughter had been seized 
whereupon she had lost consciousness from fright and when she came to again found that the four cossacks had been killed her father had been taken off and she was alone in the brutal hands of those three wild-looking tribesmen as soon as she had told us this the officer of the cossacks to which i had attached myself called the men together and in a quarter of an hour the whole body went forth to chase the kurds and rescue the baron one big cossack in his long coat and astrakhan cap was left to look after me while nicosia that was the girl's name was also left to assist him after three days they returned bringing with them the baron whose delight at finding his daughter safe and unharmed was unbounded they had fought the kurds and defeated them killing nearly twenty ah my dear murray you haven't any notion of the lawless state of that country just then and i fear it is pretty much the same now well go on urged his friend what about the girl i suppose you fell in love with her and all that eh no you're mistaken there old chap was his reply when she explained to her father what had happened the baron thanked me very warmly and invited me to visit him in budapest when my leg grew strong again he was a man of about fifty who i found spoke english very well nicosia also spoke english for she had explained to me that her mother now dead had been a londoner the baron's business in transcaucasia was he told me vaguely in connection with the survey of a new railway which the russian government was projecting eastward from Erevan. for two days he remained with us but during those days my wound was extremely painful owing to lack of surgical appliances so he spoke of very little else besides the horrible atrocities committed by the kurds he pressed me to visit him and then with an escort of our cossacks he and his daughter left for tiflis whence he took train back to hungary for six months i remained still leading that roving adventurous life my leg was well again but my journalistic commission was at an end and one day i found myself in odessa very short of funds i recollected the baron's invitation to budapest therefore i took train there and found his residence to be one of those great white houses on the franz joseph quay he received me with marked enthusiasm and compelled me to be his guest during the first week i was there i told him in confidence my position whereupon he offered me a very lucrative post as his secretary a post which i have retained until this moment and the girl walter asked much interested oh she finished her education in dresden and in paris and now she lives mostly with her aunt in vienna was hamilton's response quite recently she became engaged to young count de solwigen the son of one of the wealthiest men in austria i thought you'd probably become the happy lover lover cried his friend how could a poor devil like myself ever aspire to the hand of the daughter of the baron de hetzendorf the name doesn't convey much to you i suppose no i don't take much interest in unknown foreigners i confess replied walter with a smile ah you're not a cosmopolitan nor a financier or you would know the thousand and one strings which are pulled by conrad de hetzendorf or the curious stories afloat concerning him curious stories echoed Mary. tell me some i'm always interested in anything mysterious hamilton was silent for a few moments well old chap to tell you the truth even though i've got such a comfortable and lucrative post i'm even after these years considerably mystified how by the real nature of the baron's business oh he's a mysterious person is he very though i'm his confidential secretary and deal with his affairs in his absence yet in some matters he is remarkably close as though he fears me you live always in budapest i suppose no in summer we are at the country house a big place overlooking the danube outside semlin and commanding a wide view of the great hungarian plain the baron transacts his business there eh from there or from budapest his business is solely with an office in the boulevard des capuchines in paris and a registered telegraphic address also in paris well there is nothing very mysterious in that surely some business matters must of necessity be conducted with secrecy i know all that my dear fellow but and he hesitated as though fearing to take his friend into his confidence but what well but there no you'd laugh at me if i told you the real reason of my uneasiness i certainly won't dear hamilton murray assured him 
we are friends today dear old chap just as we were at college surely it is not the place of a man to poke fun at his friend the argument was apparently convincing the baron's secretary smoked on in thoughtful silence his eyes fixed upon the wall in front of him well he said at last if you promise to view the matter in all seriousness i'll tell you briefly it's this of course you've never been to semlin or zimini as they call it in the magyar tongue to understand aright i must describe the place in the extreme south of hungary where the river sav joins the danube the town of semlin guards the frontier upon a steep hill five kilometers from the town stands the baron's residence a long rather inartistic white building which however is very luxuriously finished comparatively modern it stands near the ruins of a great old castle of hetzendorf which commands a wide sweep of the danube now amid those ruins strange noises are sometimes heard and it is said that upon all who hear them falls some terrible calamity i'm not superstitious but i've heard them on three occasions and somehow well somehow i cannot get rid of an uncanny feeling that some catastrophe is to befall me i can't go back to semlin i'm unnerved and dare not return there noises cried walter murray what are they like he asked quickly starting from his chair and staring at his friend they seem to emanate from nowhere and are like deep but distant whispers so plain they were that i could have sworn that someone was speaking and in english too does the baron know yes i told him and he appeared greatly alarmed indeed he gave me leave of absence to come home to england well exclaimed murray what you tell me old chap is most extraordinary why there is almost an exactly similar legend connected with glencardine glencardine cried his friend glencardine castle in scotland i've heard of that do you know the place the estate marches with my father's therefore i know it well how extraordinary that there should be almost exactly the same legend concerning a hungarian castle who's the owner of glencardine sir henry hayburn a friend of mine hayburn echoed hamilton hayburn the blind man he gasped grasping the arm of his chair and staring back at his companion and he is your friend you know his daughter then yes i know gabrielle was walter's reply as there flashed across him the recollection of that passionate letter to which he had not replied why is she also your friend she certainly is hamilton was silent he saw that he was treading dangerous ground the legend of glencardine was the same as that of the old magyar stronghold of hetzendorf gabriel hayburn was murray's friend therefore he resolved to say no more gabriel hayburn End of chapter 29chapter number 30 of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain reveals something to hamilton edgar hamilton sat with his eyes fixed upon the dingy inartistic smoke begrimed windows of the chambers opposite the man before him was acquainted with gabriel hayburn for over a year he had not been in london he recollected the last occasion recollected it alas only too well his thin countenance wore a puzzled anxious expression the expression of a man face to face with a great difficulty tell me walter he said at last what kind of place is glencardine castle what kind of man is sir henry hayburn glencardine is one of the most beautiful estates in scotland it lies between perth and stirling the ruins of the ancient castle where the great marquis of glencardine who was such a figure in scottish history was born stands perched up above a deep delightful glen and some little distance off stands the modern house built in great part from the ruins of the stronghold and there are noises heard there the same as hetzendorf you say well the country folk believe that on certain nights there can be heard in the castle courtyard distinct whispering the counsel of the devil himself to certain conspirators who took the life of the notorious cardinal Citone. 
Has anyone actually heard them? They say so. Or at any rate, several persons, after declaring that they had heard them, have died quite suddenly. Hamilton pursed his lips. Well, he exclaimed, that's really most remarkable. Practically the same legend is current in South Hungary regarding Hetzendorf. Strange, very strange. Very, remarked the heir to the great estate of Conican. But, after all, cannot one very often trace the same legend through the folklore of various countries? I remember I once attended a lecture upon that very interesting subject. Oh, of course, many ancient legends have sprung from the same germ, so that often we have practically the same fairy story all over Europe. But this, it seems to me, is no fairy story. Well, laughed Murray, the history of Glencardine Castle and the historic family is so full of stirring episodes that I really don't wonder that the ruins are believed to be the abode of something supernatural. My father possesses some of the family papers, while Sir Henry, when he bought Glencardine, also acquired a quantity. Only a year ago he told me that he had had an application from a well-known historical writer for access to them, as he was about to write a book upon the family. Then you know Sir Henry well? Very well indeed. I'm often his guest and frequently shoot over the place. I've heard that Lady Hayburn is a very pretty woman, remarked the other, glancing at his friend with a peculiar look. Some declare her to be beautiful, but to myself, I confess, she's not very attractive. There are stories about her, eh? Hamilton said. As there are about every good-looking woman. Beauty cannot escape unjust criticism or the scars of lying tongues. People pity Sir Henry, I've heard. They, of course, sympathize with him. Poor old gentleman, because he's blind. His is, indeed, a terrible affliction. Only fancy the change from a brilliant parliamentary career to idleness, darkness, and knitting. I suppose he's very wealthy? He must be. The price he paid for Glencardine was a very heavy one. And, besides that, he has two other places as well as a house in Park Street and a villa in San Remo. Cotton or still or soap or some other domestic necessity, I suppose. Murray shrugged his shoulders. Nobody knows, he answered. The source of Sir Henry's vast wealth is a profound mystery. His friend smiled, but said nothing. Walter Murray had risen to obtain matches. Therefore, he did not notice the curious expression upon his friend's face, a look which betrayed that he knew more than he intended to tell. Those noises heard in the castle puzzle me, he remarked after a few moments. At Glencardine, they are known as the Whispers, Murray remarked. By Jove, I'd like to hear them. I don't think there'd be much chance of that, old chap, laughed the other. They're only heard by those doomed to an early death. I may be. Who knows? He asked gloomily. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't anticipate catastrophe. No, said his friend in a more serious tone. I've already heard those at Hetzendorf, and, well, I confess they've aroused in my mind some very uncanny apprehensions. Did you really hear them? Are you sure they were not imagination? In the night sounds always become both magnified and distorted. Yes, I'm certain of what I heard. I was careful to convince myself that it was not imagination, but actual reality. Walter Murray smiled dubiously. Sir Henry scouts the idea of whispers being heard at Glencardine, he said. And, strangely enough, so does the Baron. He's a most matter-of-fact man. How curious that the cases are almost parallel and yet so far apart. The Baron has a daughter, and so has Sir Henry. Gabrielle is at Glencardine, I suppose? asked Hamilton. No, she's living with a maiden aunt at an out-of-the-world village in Northamptonshire called Woodnewton. Oh, I thought she always lived at Glencardine and acted as her father's right hand. She did until a few months ago when... And he paused. Well, he went on, I don't know exactly what occurred, except that she left suddenly and has not since returned. Her mother, perhaps. No girl of spirit gets on well with her stepmother. Possibly that, Walter said. He knew the truth, but he had no desire to tell even his old friend of the allegation against the girl whom he loved. Hamilton noted the name of the village, and sat wondering at what the young barrister had just told him. 
it had aroused suspicion within him strange suspicions they sat together for another half hour and before they parted arranged to lunch together at the savoy in two days' time turning out of the temple edgar hamilton walked along the strand to the metropole in northumberland avenue where he was staying his mind was full of what his friend had said full of that curious legend of glencardine which coincided so strangely with that of far-off hetzendorf the jostling cloud in the busy london thoroughfare he did not see he was away again on the hill outside the old-fashioned hungarian town with the broad danube shining in the white moonbeams he saw the grim walls that had for centuries withstood the brunt of battle with the turks and from them came the whispering voice the voice said to be that of the evil one the tisgins that brown-faced race of gypsy wanderers the women with their bright-colored skirts and head-dresses and the men with the wonderful old silver filigree buttons upon their coats had related to him many weird stories regarding hetzendorf and the meaning of those whispers yet none of their stories were so curious as that which murray had just told him similar sounds were actually heard in the old castle up in the highlands his thoughts were wholly absorbed in that one extraordinary fact he went to the smoking-room off the hotel and obtaining a railway guide searched it in vain then ordering from a waiter a map of england he eagerly searched northamptonshire and discovered the whereabouts of wood newton therefore that night he left london for undal and put up at the old-fashioned talbot at ten o'clock on the following morning after making a detour he alighted from a dog-cart before the little inn called the westmoreland arms at apethorpe just outside the lodge gates of apethorpe hall and making excuse to the groom that he was going for a walk he set off at a brisk pace over the little bridge and up the hill to wood newton that morning was dark and gloomy with threatening rain and the distance was somewhat greater than he had calculated from the map at last however he came to the entrance to the long village street with its church and its rows of low thatched cottages a tiny inn called the white lion stood before him therefore he entered and calling for some ale commenced to chat with the old lady who kept the place after the usual conventionalities about the weather he said i suppose you don't have very many strangers in wood newton eh not many sir was her reply we see a few people from Oundle and northampton in the summer holiday folk but that's all then by dint of skilful questioning he elucidated the fact that old miss hayburn lived in the tiled house further up the village and that her niece who lived with her had passed along with her dog about a quarter of an hour before and taken the footpath toward southwick ascertaining this he was all anxiety to follow her but knowing how sharp our village eyes upon a stranger he was compelled to conceal his eagerness light another cigarette and continue his chat at last however he wished the woman good day and strolling halfway up the village turned into a narrow lane which led across a farmyard to a footpath which ran across the fields following a brook eager to overtake the girl he sped along as quickly as possible gabrielle hayburn he ejaculated speaking to himself her name was all that escaped his lips a dozen times that morning he had repeated it uttering it in a tone almost of wonder almost of awe across several ploughed fields he went leaving the brook skirting a high hedge to the side of a small wood he followed the well-trodden path for nearly half an hour when of a sudden he emerged from a narrow lane between two hedgerows into a large pasture before him he saw standing together on the brink of the river neen two figures a man and a woman the girl was dressed in blue serge and wore a white woolen tam o' shanter while the man had on a dark gray overcoat with a brown felt hat and near by with his eye upon some sheep grazing some distance away stood a big collie hamilton started and drew back the pair were standing together in earnest conversation the man facing him the girl with her back turned what does this mean gasped hamilton aloud what can this secret meeting mean why yes i'm certainly not mistaken it's crail felix crail by all that's amazing End of chapter 30
by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Describes a curious circumstance. To Hamilton it was evident that the man Crail, now smartly dressed in country tweeds, was telling the girl something which surprised her. He was speaking quickly, making involuntary gestures which betrayed his foreign birth, while she stood pale, surprised, and yet defiant. The baron's secretary was not near enough to overhear their words. Indeed, he remained there in concealment in order to watch. Why had Gabrielle met Felix Crail, of all men? She was beautiful. Yes, there could be no two opinions upon that point, Edgar decided. And yet how strange it all was, how very remarkable, how romantic. The man was evidently endeavoring to impress upon the girl some plain truths to which, at first, she refused to listen. She shrugged her shoulders impatiently and swung her walking stick before her in an attempt to remain unconcerned. But from where Hamilton was standing, he could plainly detect her agitation. Whatever Crail had told her had caused her much nervous anxiety. What could it be? Across the meadows beyond the river could be seen the lantern tower of old Fotheringay Church, with the mound behind where once stood the castle where ill-fated Mary met her doom. And as the baron's secretary watched, he saw that the foreigner's attitude was gradually changing from persuasive to threatening. He was speaking quickly, probably in French, making wild gestures with his hands, while she had drawn back with an expression of alarm. She was now, it seemed, frightened at the man, and to Edgar Hamilton this increased the interest tenfold. Through his mind there flashed the recollection of a previous occasion when he had seen the man now before him. He was in different garb, and acting a very different part, but his face was still the same, a countenance which it was impossible to forget. He was watching the changing expression upon the girl's face. Would that he could read the secret hidden behind those wonderful eyes. He had, quite unexpectedly, discovered a mysterious circumstance. Why should Crail meet her by accident at that lonely spot? The pair moved very slowly together along the path which, having left the way to Southwick, ran along the very edge of the broad, winding river toward Fotheringay, until they crossed the wide pasture land and followed the bend of the stream. Hamilton dare not emerge from his place of concealment. They might glance back and discover him. If so, then to watch Crail's movements further would be futile. He saw that, by the exercise of caution, he might perhaps learn something of deeper interest than he imagined. So he watched until they disappeared, and then sped along the path they had taken until he came to a clump of bushes which afforded further cover. From where he stood, however, he could see nothing. He could hear voices, a man's voice raised in distinct threats, and a woman's quick defiant response. He walked round the bushes quickly, trying to get sight of the pair, but the river bent sharply at that point in such a manner that he could not get a glimpse of them. Again he heard Crail speaking rapidly in French, and still again the girl's response. Then, next instant, there was a shrill scream and a loud splash. Next moment he had darted from his hiding place to find the girl struggling in the water, while at the same time he caught sight of Crail disappearing quickly around the path. Had he glanced back, he could not have seen the girl in the stream. At that point the bank was steep, and the stillness of the river and the absence of rushes told that it was deep. The girl was throwing up her hand, shrieking for help. Therefore, without a second's hesitation, Hamilton, who was a good swimmer, threw off his coat and diving in was soon at her side. By this time Crail had hurried on, and could obtain no glimpse of what was in progress owing to the sharp bend of the river. After considerable splashing, Hamilton urging her to remain calm, he succeeded in bringing her to land, where they both struggled up the bank dripping, wet, and more or less exhausted. Some moments elapsed before either spoke, until, indeed, Hamilton, looking straight into the girl's face, and bursting out laughing, exclaimed, Well, I think I have the pleasure of being acquainted with you, but I must say that we both look like drowned rats. I look horrid, she declared, staring at him half-dazed, putting her hands to her dripping hair. I know I must, but I have to thank you for pulling me out. Only fancy, Mr. Hamilton, you— Oh, no thanks are required. What we must do is to get someplace and get our clothes dried, he said. Do you know this neighborhood? 
oh yes straight over there about a quarter of a mile away is wyatt's farm mrs wyatt will look after us i'm sure and as she rose to her feet regarding her companion shyly her skirts clung around her and the water squelched from her shoes very well he answered cheerily let's go and see what can be done towards getting some dry kit i'm glad you're not too frightened a good many girls would have fainted and all that kind of thing i certainly should have gone under if you hadn't so fortunately come along she exclaimed i really don't know how to thank you sufficiently you've saved my life you know if it were not not for you i'd have been dead by this time for i can't swim a stroke by jove he laughed treating the whole affair as a huge joke how romantic it sounds fancy meeting you again after all this time and saving your life i suppose the papers will be full of it if they get to know gallant rescue and all that kind of twaddle well personally i hope the papers won't get hold of this piece of intelligence she said seriously as they walked together rather pitiable objects across the wide grass fields he glanced at her pale face her hair hanging dank and wet about it and saw that even under these disadvantageous conditions she had grown more beautiful than before of late he had heard of her heard a good deal of her but had never dreamed that they would meet again in that manner how did it happen he asked in pretence of ignorance of her companion's presence she raised her fine eyes to his for a moment and wavered beneath his inquiring gaze i i well i really don't know was her rather lame answer the bank was very slippery and well i suppose i walked too near her reply struck him as curious why did she attempt to shield the man who by his sudden flight was self-convicted of an attempt upon her life felix Crail was not a complete stranger to her why had their meeting been a clandestine one this and a thousand similar queries ran through his mind as they walked across the field in the direction of a long low thatched farmhouse which stood in the distance i'm a complete stranger to these parts hamilton informed her i live nowadays mostly abroad away above the danube and i'm only home for a holiday and i'm afraid you've completely spoilt your clothes she laughed looking at his wet muddy trousers and boots well if i have yours also are no further good oh my blouse will wash and i shall send my skirt to the cleaners and it will come back like new she answered women's outdoor clothing never suffers by a wedding we'll get mrs wyatt to dry them and then i'll get home again to my aunt in wood newton do you know the place i fancy i passed through it this morning one of those long lean villages with a church at the end that's it the dullest little place in all england i believe he was struck by her charm of manner though bedraggled and dishevelled she was nevertheless delightful and treated her sudden immersion with careless unconcern why had crail attempted to get rid of her in that manner what motive had he they reached the farmhouse where mrs wyatt a stout ruddy-faced woman detecting their approach met them upon the threshold locks miss hayburn why what's happened she asked in alarm i fell into the river and this gentleman fished me out that's all laughed the girl we want to dry our things if we may in a few minutes in bedrooms upstairs they had exchanged their wet clothes for dry ones then edgar in the farmer's sunday suit of black and gabrielle in one of mrs wyatt's stuff dresses in the big folds of which her slim little figure was lost met again in the spacious farmhouse kitchen below they laughed heartily at the ridiculous figure which each presented and drank the glasses of hot milk which the farmer's wife pressed upon them old miss hayburn had been mrs wyatt's mistress years ago when she was in service therefore she was most solicitous after the girls's welfare and truth to tell looked askance at the good-looking stranger who had accompanied her gabrielle too was puzzled to know why mr hamilton should be there that he now lived abroad beside the danube was all the information he had vouchsafed regarding himself yet from certain remarks he had dropped she was suspicious she recollected only too vividly the occasion when when they had met last and what had occurred they sat together on the bench outside the house enjoying the full sunshine while the farmer's wife chattered on big fire had been made in the kitchen and their clothes were rapidly drying hamilton by careful questions endeavored to obtain from the girl some information concerning her dealings with the man crail but she was too wary it was evident that she had some distinct object in concealing the fact that he had deliberately flung her into the water after the heated altercation 
felix crail the very name caused him to clench his hands fortunately he knew the truth therefore the dastardly attempt upon the girl's life should not go unpunished as he sat there chatting with her admiring her refinement and innate daintiness he made a vow within himself to seek out that cowardly fugitive and meet him face to face felix crail what could be his object in ridding the world of the daughter of sir henry Hayburn? what would the man gain thereby he knew crail too well to imagine that he ever did anything without a motive of gain so well did he play his cards always that the police could never lay hands upon him yet his friends as he termed them were among the most dangerous men in all europe men who were unscrupulous and who would hesitate at nothing in order to accomplish the coup which they had devised what was the coup in this particular instance ay that was the question End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain outside the window late on the following afternoon gabrielle was seated at the old-fashioned piano in her aunt's tiny drawing-room her fingers running idly over the keys her thoughts wandering back to the exciting adventure of the previous morning her aunt was out visiting some old people in connection with the village clothing club therefore she sat gloomily amusing herself at the piano and thinking ever thinking she had been playing almost mechanically berger's amoureuse valves and some dreamy music from the merry widow when she suddenly stopped and sat back with her eyes fixed out of the window upon the cottages opposite why was mr hamilton in that neighborhood he had given her no further information concerning himself he seemed to be disinclined to talk about his recent movements he had sprung from nowhere just at the critical moment when she was in such deadly peril then after their clothes had been dried they had walked together as far as the little bridge at the entrance to fotheringay there he had stopped bent gallantly over her hand congratulated her upon her escape and as their ways lay in opposite directions she back to woodnewton and he on to oundle they had parted i hope miss hayburn that we may meet again one day he laughed cheerily as he raised his hat good-bye then he had turned away and had been lost to view round the bend of the road she was safe that man whom she had known long ago under such strange circumstances whom she would probably never see again had been her rescuer of this curious and romantic fact she was now thinking but where was walter why had he not replied to her letter ah that was the one thought which oppressed her always sleeping and waking day and night why had he not written would he never write again she had at first consoled herself with the thought that he was probably on the continent and that her letter had not been forwarded but as the days went on and no reply came the truth became more and more apparent that her lover the man whom she adored and worshipped had put her aside had accepted her at her own estimate as worthless a thousand times she regretted that step she had taken in writing that cruel letter before she left glencardine but it was all too late she had tried to retract but alas it was now impossible tears welled in her splendid eyes at thought of the man whom she had loved so well the world had indeed been cruel to her her enemies had profited by her inexperience and she had fallen an unhappy victim of an unscrupulous blackguard yes it was only too true she did not try to conceal the ugly truth from herself yet she had been compelled to keep walter in ignorance of the truth for he loved her a hardness showed at the corners of her sweet lips and the tears rolled slowly down her cheeks then bestirring herself with an effort her white fingers ran over the keys again and in her sweet musical voice she sang l'air de mer that pretty valse chante so popular in paris voici l'air de mer l'air de tendresses dis moi les mots très doux qui vont me guiser ah prends moi dans tes bras fais moi des caresses je vais mourir pour revivre sur ton baiser Importe moi dans un rêve amoureux. 
bien l'on sur la terre en canoe pour que l'antems meme en rebrand les yeux ses rêves continue crayons et mons vivants un jour c'est si bon mais si court bon air de vivre ici bas de manu dans un moment d'amour the hour of love how full of burning love and sentiment she stopped reflecting on the meaning of those words she was not like the average miss who parrot-like knows only a few french or italian songs italian she loved even better than french and could read dante and petrarch in the original while she possessed an intimate knowledge of the poetry of italy from the medieval writers down to carducci and dianzano with a sigh she glanced around the small room with its old-fashioned furniture its anti-macassars of the early victorian era its wax flowers under their glass dome and its gypsy table covering with a hand embroidered cloth it was also very dispiriting the primness of the what-not decorated with pieces of treasure china the big gilt framed over mantel and the old punch bowl filled with potpourri all spoke mutely of the thin-nosed old spinster to whom the veriest speck of dust was an abomination sighing still again the girl turned once more to the old-fashioned instrument with its faded crimson silk behind the walnut fretwork and playing the plaintive melody sang an ancient serenade di questo cor tu ma ferito il cor il santa copi pi non val mantre pensa che non sopporto pi il dorla e se si gui sacose vada al more ti tingo nella mente a tut le or se lavoro se la vilo o sto a dorme e mantre dorme anacora un sono grato mi trovo tuco la cream bagnato while she sang there was a rap at the front door and just as she concluded the prim maid entered with a letter upon a salver in an instant her heart gave a bound she recognized the handwriting it was walter's the moment the girl had left the room she tore open the envelope and holding her breath read what was written within the words were dearest heart your letter came to me after several wanderings it has caused me to think and wonder if after all i may be mistaken if after all i have misjudged you darling i gave you my heart it is true but you spurned it under compulsion you say why under compulsion who is it who compels you to act against your will and against your better nature i know that you love me as well and as truly as i love you yourself i long to see you with just as great a longing you are mine mine my own and being mine you must tell me the truth i forgive you forgive you for everything but i cannot understand what flockhart means by saying that i have spoken of you i have not seen the man nor do i wish to see him gabrielle do not trust him he is your enemy as he is mine he has lied to you as grim circumstance has forced you to treat me cruelly let us hope that smiling fortune will be ours at last the world is very small i have just met my old friend edgar hamilton who was at college with me and who i find is secretary to some wealthy foreigner a certain baron de hetzendorf i have not seen him for years and yet he turns up here merry and prosperous after struggling for a long time with adverse circumstances but gabrielle your letter has puzzled and alarmed me the more i think of it the more mystifying it all becomes i must see you and you must tell me the truth the whole truth we love each other dear heart and no one shall force you to lie again to me as you did in that letter you wrote from glencardine you wish to see me darling you shall and you shall tell me the truth my dear love au revoir until we meet which i hope may be almost as soon as you receive this letter my love my sweetheart i am your own walter she sat staring at the letter he demanded an explanation he intended to come there and demand it and the explanation was one which he dared not give rather that she took her own life than tell him the ghastly circumstances he had met an old chum named hamilton was this the mr hamilton who had snatched her from that deadly peril the name of hetzendorf sounded to be austrian or german how strange if mr hamilton her rescuer were the same man who had been years ago her lover's college friend she had passed her white hand across her brow trying to collect her senses she had longed oh with such intense longing for a response to that letter of hers and here at last it had come 
but what a response he intended her to make confession he demanded to know the actual truth what could she do how should she act holding the letter in her hand she glanced around the little room in utter despair he loved her his words of reassurance brought her great comfort but he wished to know the truth he suspected something by her own action in writing those letters she had aroused a suspicion against herself she regretted yet what was the use of regret her own passionate words had revealed to him something which he had not suspected and he was coming down here to wood newton to demand the truth he might even then be on his way if he asked her point blank what could she reply she dare not tell him the truth there were now but two roads open either death by her own hand or to lie to him could she tell him an untruth no she loved him therefore she could not resort to false declarations and deceit better far better would it be that she took her own life better she thought if mr hamilton had not plunged into the river after her if her life had ended walter murray would at least have been spared the bitter knowledge of a disgraceful truth her face grew pale and her mouth hardened at the thought she loved him with all the fierce passion of her young heart he was her hero her idol before her tear-dimmed eyes his dear serious face rose a sweet memory of what had been tender remembrances of his fond kisses still lingered with her she recollected how around her waist his strong arm would steal and how slowly and yet irresistibly he would draw her in his arms in silent ecstasy alas that was all past and over they loved each other but she was now face to face with what she had so long dreaded face to face with the inevitable she must either confess the truth and by so doing turn his love to hatred or else remain silent and face the end she re-read the letter still seated at the piano her elbows resting inertly upon the keys then she lifted her pale face again to the window gazing out blankly upon the village street so dull so silent so uninteresting the thought of mr hamilton the man who held a secret of hers and who only a few hours before had rescued her from the peril in which felix crail had placed her again recurred to her was it not remarkable that he walter's old friend should come down into that neighbourhood there was some motive in his visit what could it be he had spoken of hungary a country which had always possessed for her a strange fascination was it not quite likely that being walters's friend hamilton on his return to london would relate the exciting incident of the river had he seen crail and if so did he know him these two points caused her the greatest apprehension suppose he had recognized crail suppose he had overheard that man's demands and her defiant refusal he would surely tell walter she bit her lip and her white fingers clenched themselves in desperation why should all this misfortune fall upon her to wreck her young life other girls were gay careless and happy they visited and motored and flirted and danced and went to theatres in town and to suppers afterwards at the carlton or savoy and had what they termed a ripping good time but to her poor little self all pleasure was debarred only the grim shadows of life were hers her mind had become filled with despair why had this great calamity befallen her why had she by her own action in writing to her lover placed herself in that terrible position from which there was no escape save by death the recollection of the whispers those fatal whispers of glencardine flashed through her distressed mind was it actually true as the country folk declared that death overtook all those who overheard the counsels of the evil one it really seemed as though there actually was more in the weird belief than she had acknowledged her father had scouted the idea yet old stuart who had personally known instances had declared that evil and disaster fell inevitably upon any one who had chanced to hear those voices of the night the recollection of that moonlight hour among the ruins and the distinct voices whispering caused a shudder to run through her she had heard them with her own ears and ever since that moment nothing but catastrophe upon catastrophe had fallen upon her yes she had heard the whispers and she could not escape their evil influence any more than those other unfortunate persons to whom death had come so unexpectedly and swiftly a shadow passed the window causing her to start 
the figure was that of a man she rose from the piano with a cry and stood erect motionless statuesque end of chapter thirty two